Welcome. My name is Olivia O'Hearn and I'm the Assistant Curator at Nottingham Contemporary. And tonight it's my pleasure to welcome you to Five Bodies, our online poetry reading series. For those of you tuning in for the first time, Nottingham Contemporary works with artists and academics to reflect on how research and practice intertwine in contemporary art and visual cultures. Our public program aims to understand how sensing, feeling and knowing might support other world making narratives. So Five Bodies is our new year long monthly poetry reading series, which looks at how practices of attention, invention and experimentation might help us develop new sensibilities. Therefore, the series welcomes some unexpected pairings, drifts and multiple voices to reflect on sensorial, social and political bodies. The series was imagined in conjunction with our colleague Sarah Jackson at Nottingham Trent University, who has led the Critical Poetics Research Group since 2015, exploring creative critical practice, hybrid methodologies and experimental thinking. I'd like to take this opportunity to show our gratitude to Danika Kelly, James Goodwin and Sandeep Palmar for contributing three incredible readings for tonight's session. I'd also like to thank Sophia Lemos for her invaluable work developing the series and Jack Thacker for his commitment and contributions. A word of thank you to Nottingham Trent University and the University of Nottingham for generously supporting our events and to my colleagues Jim Brewer and Ryan Kearney for their technical support this evening. We encourage participation so please do post any questions or comments that you may have in the chat on YouTube. We also have AI driven live captioning which can be found in the YouTube chat which will open in a separate window on your browser and within that you can adjust the scale and the layout to suit your requirements. Finally I'd like to introduce tonight's chair Dr Linda Kemp. Linda is a poet and research fellow at Nottingham Trent University. Based in the Department of Social Work, Care and Community, their research adopts a cross-disciplinary stance focusing on poetry and collaborative creative practices with a specific focus on critical poetics. The research encompasses the creative and critical to include poetry, creative critical writing, collaboration, performance and scholarly articles. Linda's first book, Lease Prize Redux, was first published by Materials in 2016, and their more recent publication, Stitch, was published by Contraband Books just a couple of weeks ago. Other poems can be found in various journals and anthologies, including A Glimpse of, Data Bleed, and Zarf. Thank you all for listening. I'll now hand over to Linda, and I hope you enjoy tonight's event. Thank you, Olivia, and welcome to Five Bodies, this collaboration between Nottingham Contemporary and the Critical Poetics Research Group. Continuing on from last month's readings and a workshop yesterday at Nottingham Contemporary, this evening offers critical exploration of relationships between creative and critical thought and practice, challenging perceived disciplinary separations and hoping to explore experimental approaches to creative reading and writing. Tonight's poets offer alternative ways of thinking, feeling, reading, writing and knowing about the contemporary world, its histories and its possible futures. Although we're not in the same room together this evening, we can share this virtual space to think and listen together. It is my pleasure to introduce the poets reading tonight. I'm going to introduce all three poets together now so that we can enjoy their work uninterrupted. Each poet is going to read for around 20 minutes each and do be aware that this evening these are not live readings. The readings will be followed by some live closing thoughts from myself and the opportunity for responses to the readings for those who stay on and do pop those thoughts and queries and questions into the chat. So I'm delighted to introduce our three poets. First, we have Donica Kelly. Donica is a poet and assistant professor at the University of Iowa, where she teaches creative writing. She is the author of a chapbook, a varium published by 500 Places, 
and the full length collections, the renunciation coming uh, forthcoming with Grey Wolf Press and Beastry also published with Grey Wolf Press. Donica is the winner of the Cave Canaan Poetry Prize, a Hurston Wright Legacy Award for Poetry and the Kate Tufts Discovery Award. She is a Cave Canaan Graduate Fellow and a member of the collective Poets at the End of the World. Following Donica's reading, we will have James Goodwin. James is a poet and scholar whose pamphlet Aspects Caught in the Headspace We're In, Composition for Friends, has though recently been published by Face Press. His debut book, Fleshed Out for All the Corners of the Slip, is forthcoming with the excellent 87 Press. His creative and critical work has appeared in online and print publications such as Intercapillary Space, Data Bleed, No Prizes, The Berkeley Review, Earthbound Press and Poetry Wales. Further work is forthcoming with Grant Magazine and Hive. James is currently reading for a PhD in English and Humanities at Birkbeck, University of London, with a thesis on the black socio-poetics of marinage, breath, sacralality and emanation. James also led the Five Bodies workshop yesterday, drawing on themes of lyses, friendship and listening. So it's exciting today to see how James's own practice is reflected in his poetics. And finally, the third poet tonight is Sandeep Palmer. Sandeep is a poet and scholar born in Nottingham and is currently a professor of English literature at the University of Liverpool. Her poetry collection, The Marble Orchard, was published in 2012 and I deal in was published in 2017, winning a Ledbury Fort Prize for the best second collection. The chapbook Myth of the Savage Tribes, Myth of Civilised Nations, was published in 2014 and is a collaboration between Sandeep and James Byrne. Palmer's own scholarship focuses on British and American modernism, particularly women's autobiographical writing by lesser known writers such as Mina Loy and Nancy Cunard. Palmer is a BBC New Generation thinker and currently co-director of Liverpool's Centre for New and International Writing. So without further ado, it is my pleasure to hand over to Donica, James and Sandeep. Thank you. Hi, my name is Danika Kelly. Uh, I am very excited to be joining uh, the Nottingham Contemporary uh, in, in their presentation of the Five Bodies reading series. Uh, I want to say just a quick thanks to Sophia Lemos and Ryan Kearney uh, for helping me figure out how to make this possible. And uh, I'm just gonna just gonna get into some poems. So the first poem that I'm going to read, sorry, I was thinking maybe I would read from a different, from my chat book, but uh, the first poem that I'm going to read uh, is the first poem in my first book, um, and it is titled Out West. Out West. Refuse the old means of measurement. Rely instead on the thrumming wilderness of self. Listen. You have been lost for some time, taking comfort in being home to any wandering thing. Sheep and brown cows graze your heart pocket. Antelope and bison lap the great lake of your eye, and in your ear the black bear winters. You name your dawn shadow, rabbit. You name your dusk shadow, spur. And the river that cuts you as it runs west, you name it persistence. Look, if you could bear sobriety, you'd be sober. If you could bear being a person, you would no longer be an iron bluff. Do not wander. We are all apportioned a certain measure of stillness. So the next poem that I would like to read uh, is inspired um, by Rita Dove's fifth grade autobiography, uh, 
which is a really, really amazing, wonderful poem. And uh, after I read it, um, I don't know, there was something in it that made me want to write a little autobiography. Uh, and there was, uh, I think this moment in my life felt like a, a prime one for, for this response to Rita Dove's work. Uh, fourth grade autobiography. We live in Los Angeles, California. We have a front yard and a backyard. My favorite things are cartwheels, salted plums, and playing catch with my dad. I squeeze, squeeze the grass and dirt between my fingers, eat my tongue white. He launches every ball into orbit. Every ball drops like an anvil, heavy and straight into my hands. I am afraid of riots and falling and the dark. The sunset of flames ringing our block, groceries and Asian-owned storefronts. No one to catch me. Midnight walks from his room to mine. I believe in the devil. I have a sister and a brother and a strong headlock. We have a dog named Spunky, Fawn and Black. We have an olive tree, a black walnut tree, a fig tree. We lie in the grass and wonder who writes in the sky. I lie in the grass and imagine my name, a cloud drifting. Saturday dance parties, everyone drunk on pink panties, screwdrivers, and Canadian club. Dominoes and spades, Al Green and Mac 10. Sometimes mama dances with a dog. Sometimes my dad dances with me. I am careful not to touch. He is careful to smile with his whole face. Self-portrait as a door. Uh, and usually when I read this poem, I talk a little bit about uh, how there was a, uh, a New Year's celebration or uh, New Year's like several, I wanna say like maybe eight years ago now, um, where after like on New Year's Day in Arkansas, which is where my family lives now and where my mom's family is from, uh, we, are they found um, in these fields, like all of these black birds that had died. And part of the reason that they think the birds died is that they were startled by the fireworks. And so, uh, I don't know, there was something about that, that sort of startling, uh, that uh, felt interesting to me, I would say. Uh, also later, I, when I lived in a different part of the US uh, in, uh, New York State, like not New York City, but um, closer uh, to the to the western side of the state. Uh, I was reading this poem, and a, a woman came up to me and said, "Those were our blackbirds." And I guess those blackbirds normally, like in the in the spring um, and summer, lived in New York and then migrated south for the winter. Uh, and so that that also felt interesting to me. So this poem is titled "Self Portrait as a Door." All the birds die of blunt force trauma, of barn, of wire, of yield, or slow children at play. You are a sign, are a plank, are a raft, are a failed oak. You are a handle, are a turn, are a bit of brass lovingly polished. What birds, what bugs, what soft hand come knocking, what echo, what empty, what room in need of a picture, a mirror, a bit of paint on the wall. There is a hooked rug. There is a hand hard as you are hard pounding the door. There is the doormat, owl eye patched by a boot, by a body with a tree for a hand. What roosts, what burrows, what scrambles at the pound. There is a you on the other side, cold and white as the room, in need of a window or an eye. There is your hand on the door, which is now the door, pretending to be a thing that opens. Uh, and the last poem that I'll read from this is titled Archaeology. So, Archaeology. More and more, I find the image of my father in my own face, an emptiness behind the eyes. I am unable to move, the oar in my blood, slurried and slow, the sun bruising the sky in its slow drag. I am dragging his face out of my own. I am the sun and the sky 
and the hot bruise. I squint against my own light, which is my father's light, which is me. I am an archaeologist, sifting the grit of my muddled blood. There is nothing behind my eyes but the stone you left me. With him, you left when he settled into my face. A hot bruise. I am dragging the sun in my empty blood. More and more, I find the image of ore, your muddled eyes. You are unable to move. Archaeologist, you sift my face, which is his, which is stone. So I want to turn now to uh, some poems from uh, my new collection called The Renunciations. It comes out uh, in May uh, of 2021. And yeah, so I think I'll just, uh, I'll read a few poems, a few poems from here. Danica questions the oracle. Who hid my dad in the mountain, impoverished where he would remain, invisible and rationed, not on milk and honey, but on bologna and saltines, until he grew strong enough to kill the father? Which father? Do I mean his daddy, exiled for the rest of his diabetic days to a closet and a house with no power, no water, where my dad, his sisters and his brothers, caught for a time by the crack rock and the pipe lighting up in the dark, lived? Surely not his daddy, Oracle. Surely not. How long was he the youngest? How long was he a child? What god swallowed him whole? The god, perhaps, who split his mother in two or took his brother with a bullet from another father's gun in the sunlight in the afternoon. Did he really hold his dying brother's hand, Oracle, the brother who wanted only an apology on my dad's behalf? Who held him when his mother died? Who told him of a heaven where dead mothers and brothers go? Oh the pigeons. What of the pigeons, Oracle? Did he tend them, watch them rise from the roof of the house with no power or water but a daddy in a closet, his sisters and brothers flaring in the rock light? Did he delight in their return? The pigeons, I mean, did he ever delight, Oracle, in anything a child might? Did he look for his name in the sky? Did he ride a bike made from junk parts in the south central LA sun fast as a boy might? Surely he did that, Oracle. Surely that. And when he rose like an improbable stone from the father's gut, whichever father I mean here, whichever father makes sense, the siblings, the pigeons, his daddy in exile, his name in the sky, when he rose with the stone of himself in his hand, covered in bile and mucus, free now of someone more powerful than the child he surely once was, did he know the terrible thing he would become? My father visits the oracle before I am born. He expects a vision of his own death, body opened as his mother's, abrupt and with mercy. He expects the barrel of the gun. He expects exile in the closet. He expects, in short, a truncated life. By now, he knows intervention is only postponement. He asks, And the oracle answers, afterward and forever, he disavows his body as something he can control. Uh, portrait of my father as a winged boar. Uh, this poem, uh, there's something I want to say about this. This poem uh, draws on the myth of Medusa, who after uh, she was beheaded, her, uh, from her neck emerged Pegasus, which I think most people are familiar with. Um, some, I think there's also a version of the story where it's like her blood hits the earth and from that blood in the earth, Pegasus sort of emerges. Um, and uh, I was really surprised to find out that Pegasus had a sibling uh, and that sibling was either uh, a winged boar or it was a golden giant man. And if it was a golden giant man, then uh, the myth that follows that strain uh, 
he ends up, and I think the, the name is Cryosaur or something like that. Um, he becomes the father of Jorion, who had the red cattle uh, that Heracles eventually slays, right? Or steals um, after, after killing Jorion. So, Portrait of my father as a winged boar. When his mother dies, by metal turned slicing blade, from her body springs my father whose name I refuse to say as he refuses his father, the half-known man who sired him. In the dry L.A. light, the boy, my father, turns so that he is caught, one way a winged boar, another a giant, a gold blade of a man, both high-skulled, thick-maned, a juvenile without a sounder, a boy without a mother. He recognizes himself only in the man, carves himself into golden armor, but the rutting fact of him, the curved tooth, the thick neck and beating wings, trembles beneath his skin. Whatever sheen the California sun burnishes out of his body, whatever good work his thickening hand compels, whatever woman he touches in the afternoon on the roof, he cannot deny his firstborn, his red fledgling, her many heads and hands, what he makes for her. A junk bike she loves. Cattle, red in the field, a mirror, a red wreckage of her body. So just two more poems. Um, from the Catalog of Cruelty. Once, I slapped my sister with the back of my hand. We were so small, but I wanted to know how it felt. My hand raised high across the opposite, opposite shoulder, slicing down like a trapeze. Her face caught my hand. I'd slapped her in our yellow room with circus animals on the curtains. I don't remember how it felt. I was a rough child. I said, no. I said, these are my things. I was speaking usually of my socks. White, athletic, thin, and already gray on the bottom, never where I'd left them. I was speaking of my fists raining down on my brother's back, my sister's socks. In the fourth grade in California, I kicked Charles in the testicles. At that school, we played sock ball, hit the red playground ball with the sides of our hands and ran the bases. I kicked Charles with the top of my foot, caught him in the hinge of ankle. I wanted to see what would happen. I didn't believe anything could hurt like it did on TV. Charles folded in half at the crease of his waist. My God, I was a rough child, but I believed, Charles, that my foot turned him to paper. Later, I kicked my dad the same way, but he did not crumple. It was summer in Arkansas. What humidity, these children full of water. I hit him also with a frying pan. I hit him also with a guitar. We laughed later. Where did the guitar come from? My dad was a star collapsing. The first thing a dying star does is swell, swallows whatever is near. He tried to take us into his body, which was the house the police entered. This is how I knew he was dying. I'd called the police. What is your name? He tried to put us through the walls of the house the police entered, which was his body. What is your name? Compromised, the integrity of a body contracting. What is your name, sir? He answered Kronos. He answered, I'm hungry. He answered, a god long dead. He threw up all his children right there on the carpet. After all, we were so small, the children. The thing about a star collapsing is that it knows neither that it is a star nor in collapse. Everything is stardust, everything essential. What is your name? Everything is resisting arrest. Its gravity crushes the children and the cruiser's rear passenger window. The officer didn't know the star's name. White dwarf, black hole, to see. Throw the collapsing star face first into anything. Face first into the back seat. Face first into the pepper spray. Face first into the pre onto the precinct lawn. Did you know you could throw a star? Do you understand gravity, its weaknesses? You are in my house. You should already know my name. Uh, so the last poem I'll read um, has a somewhat misleading title. Uh, it's titled The Moon Rose Over the Bay. I had a lot of feelings. Uh, there is neither a moon nor a bay in this poem. Um, and yet 
I, I feel like the title really captures the, the feeling of, of the poem. Uh, this also comes out of an exercise uh, the poet Gabby Cavalcaresi gave, uh, I was in a workshop with her and she gave us this exercise. Um, and the exercise that she gave us was an adaptation of an exercise that Rita Dove uh, often gives, um, or submitted for uh, uh, an anthology on, uh, with poetry prompts. So, uh, so this comes out of like the confluence of, of those two experiences. The moon rose over the bay. I had a lot of feelings. The home I've been making inside myself started with a raising, a brush clearing, the thorn and nettle, the blackberry bush falling under the bush hog. Then I rested, a cycle fallow, said winter, said the ground is too cold to break pony, said I almost set fire to it all, lit a match, watched it ghost in the wind. Came the thaw, came the melting snowpack, the flooded river, new groundwater, the well risen. I stood in the mud field and called it a pasture, stood with a needle in my mouth and called it a song. Everything rushed past my small ears, were in the leaves, were in the wing and the wood. About time to get a hammer, I thought. About time to get a nail and saw. Thank you. Hi, good evening. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, and I just wanted to quickly thank um, those at the Not Nottingham Contemporary um, for their support um, in making this possible. Um, particularly Sophia, Ryan, Jack, Linda, Sarah, and Olivia. Um, I want to begin by reading a section of an essay which I'm trying to finish, um, which touches on certain aspects of last night's critical uh, poetics workshop, which many of us, many of us took part in. Um, the essay itself um touches on ideas of praxis um lysis experimentality phase transitions um blackness um, um corporeality um and embodiment movement without change means we see the imperceptible thing immediately connected with us the thing that moves without change undertakes in us the reinvention of experimental poetics given in its ethereal dissipation and in its dissipated aeration, lytically, lyrically, gives off the sound of the uncreated, the uncreated sounding, fleshing out of that which is and has content without form, that doesn't proceed by individual creative acts of will but precedes in writing's proliferation of intractable and so volatile animateriality. No point of departure is made, only the auto-affection of a pre-enacted, as yet unknown pull or repulsion of something else's departure that we wake in and wake with. It is a moment of departure repeated, which is to say deferred, one time by air, another by road, to invoke Hannah Black. What's given is the givenness of a modes or medium's prescient non-locality, the air given a second time in and by road. Quote, does every departure repeat an original departure, Black writes? I want to get at something about how Lysis is not an intervention, a discursive referent proffering an existing institutional nexus of formerly intersubjective recitations of doctrinal first final truths. Its philopoetic movement is one that is felt in the intra animation of non separable prima materia. In our Anna phonomorphological sounding, falling, rising, suspending, tiring, becoming matter in our exhaustion to invoke Simone Bay, 
fleshed out spiritus breath of earthly inhabitation that we don't experiment with alone because we are an effect of it. We are the sounds of something unmade. I don't want to conjecture the intimation that in the experimental zone of non-being, non-knowledge, non-substance, etc., we epiphenomenally fumigate, purify the bio-socio-poetic backdrop, the experimental horizon of the individual practitioner distantiating blackness from philopoetics, philopoetics's animaterial permeability, the flesh and breath which is the uncreated matter of and forethought which is not ours, but rather instead that in philopoetic thought there is nothing that we are not, making us into no one, nobody, nowhere. Black writes, quote, when we are no one, we are nowhere, but we travel in the hopes of finding a place to stay still or someone to stay still with. And as soon as we found it, we move again, because it must at least be possible that never moving is the same as always moving. And we believe our nothingness to be constitutive. The decreative establishment of lytic experimentality in poetics veers us away from the otherworldly utility of praxis. Writing is our passing through, in passing as sky, shadow, earth, stone, where we don't know who or where we are, but we must be something other than ourselves. Experimental poetics emits diffusely and enfolds us toward philopoetic plenitude. The infinite is our means and ends, and not strictly over or above or under the distribution of life and death. Interventive practices of living with in the interminable communality of experimentation de re unconstitute the content and mode of in bodily ethereality escaping, but itself not being or existing as escaped from blackness, its own etherealness. For as Black says, quote, it takes practice to leave right, to undergo it in lysis. Fanon comes back through Black by way of nothing other than the inexhaustibly minute and cosmic transubstantiation of being Black in the world, wherein Fanon's movements don't so much foreground the possibility of extricating himself from praxis, understood in the sense of action directed towards some change out there, because nothing for him changes. What's revealed in his active gestures, but concealed by his black bodily schemata, is an overdeterminate relationality which presupposes his universal and subjective subordination to the others, the whites, real phantasmatic morphogenesis of and in Fanon's black racialized schema. Quote, all around the body reigns an atmosphere of certain uncertainty. I know that if I want to smoke, I shall have to stretch out my right arm and grab a pack of cigarettes lying at the other end of the table. As for the matches, they are in the left drawer and I shall have to move back a little. And I make all these moves, not out of habit, but by implicit knowledge. The slow construction of myself as a body in a spatial temporal world, such seems to be my schema. It is not imposed on me, it is rather a definitive structuring of myself and the world. Fanon continues, quote, Beneath my body schema, I had created a historical racial schema. I, the, 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 sorry, the data I used were provided not by remnants of feelings and notions of the tactile, vestibular, kinesthetic or visual nature, but by the other, the white man, who had woven me out of a thousand details, anecdotes and stories. Blackness here is experimental praxis's lytic suspension of forms of life given in dialectical phenomenologies, configurative accounts and accounting of the transcendental subject. What blackness evinces instead, instead is phase. Phase instead, instead of form, experimentality in poetics before in being ahead of praxis. Real don't recognize real. Writing it yields to the presence of non-life, 
the aporectic limits of certain uncertainty constantly crossed in lysis and immaterialization of black bodily movement without change. No concession is made possible or warranted to prior spatiotemporally corpuscular relations to transcendental modes of, re of representation in experimental praxis, only to the flesh and breath out from within the black body's own singular moments of emergence from and, sub and submergence into the uncreated, decreated prima materia, which is, which is the medium of and for philopoetic thought. Lysis will have been its condition, sorry, Lysis will have been the condition of its impossible enactment. The body that questions Merton writes, because it is a body that is in question, is an experiment. This poem is called Side with the Imminent Vex. Impatience in plain that we let the damned and wretched wave new circuitry. Think oxygenated epidermis, torn, wasted, driven on ends, siding with the imminent vex. Through trabecular songs approximating stuttered oceanics, unremitting wakes out from fleshing the contact of sound unmade, coming already met, finally conscripts around its involution of new new phase transitions in the crypt. Might just feel like finding other ways to lurk without shops opening shutters onto seasides we couldn't discern with our hands. A strip of air whips from essential to essential right down to this essence of evasion so much that it takes us along a Delphic soma. With the same interminable sky, we love this something that we are at all, strict in daylighting cycles and collections, in never having been back from a felled miasma. The night holds philharmonics we forget, as long as there's also the promise of a sea without terminus, far out from the familial subsumations of an uncheckable key it lit until years later. Yard overflows an expanse of planetary mains, wherewithal the impress bespeaking encountered restless othering encounters. Feels like coruscating an accents we wear outside of ourselves for the life on track. Listen instead for the elated skip, boldened, elastic. To seven blacks killed in a septet, and more caught slipping in and out seeing, but here we're the ones that need help living how to see our missions hum hell a lot colder and purely unrepeated. Our residues are any material, brush co-substantial, marauding a failed subjectivity, lest the dead and dying smoke a personal orbit they pretend to dip, outlast your tug set, overlay a more tabernacular beam, but still good for you and your friends, iterant twilights, you're the black knight, doused levity, fish fish of an indigo rasa, staring blank aboriginal salt back, still clapping the same broad sways of high wind rush outside our lanes and streets, for one of the people's cracked anathemic songs saying true say, we run upon how we sounded lyric for lyric, like you think, is that what you think? Stepping your way out of this poetry for what was left unsaid of your sense of touch through feeling these sensations, I can feel your tears in our gilded fabric like granular scansion stress audible to remission. As lies sentimental house and harbor for the imminent vex, but must not, but nobody knows. Crypt in resounding this or that metaphoric hylomorph thrusting a black kid's spit and aerial pleonasm makes in us sit and shit an organizing principle we don't leave outside or inside our ruinous flooring, teeth and skin, lip, nail, eyelid, breath and phosphorus, more spit without making duppy and instead when I don't know you but you must know who I am syncopated plumes and shattered. In blockades, there's echo in compress, corners on corners, lyric vex on long sequesters. 
lack eviscerating givenness taking us up in the clouds seeded liminal looks gave ancestors enfleshed you can't see their reflections glare of sunlight rim they are too alloyed and all day artfully black boreal black light visioning the same splitting of black action going to this place called nowhere fast and it's got to work Ereal, hard flat never says what because they are there from ions and rhythms rhythms of work setting pace around the bits of anamorphological rhythms of work setting pace around the bits of grimshard ice shadows be barely viewed crossing blocked off lays cresting a pure state lexus behind the curb an ethereal offshot rules of threes unprotected still built to task yet nobody made us just roll back abiding script a dead weight ride Speak an aporectic crowd in a burst daydream on a real rhododendron. Can't then CCTV a slice of black world sheet the way we lay of the land under streetlight mystic arc. We talk. Ethereal dreaming that we crossed short circuiting all cadences of the heartbeat no change to the words untimely bussing that we hear us from all ends of the visceral clamor in single myriads unseen from or regarded. We made realness forever return burst baseness of verse to link us outside, outside the yard without lines for the emotions running on pull up in the darkness leading deep enough to get us lost in remaining in a long list of stairs. Whole arrays of sun carrying inside each celestial rhythm of the words step, getting across personal back from earth in a movement without change, making a sea change, all the long remembering our share of coalescence. What are we to look at? And how saying it won't figure a line of flight jade of fluidity on air we dress in. Glints of sunset, eyes touch, waters humming mid-drift out of focus, rotates its pulsations, the planetary montage we feel out for. So much there, history just settled. Arc leveling suite of denuded sea greens into fuchsia pink F majors, breaking live notes and looks away like surf. But evidence of things not seen as black, blue, vermilion. Deck of flesh of dusk in its already dawning. Dust picked up dawning. Also a witness of truth. Morbidity leaving heat glow or inclement thesis with only tertiary gleans to signal dying woven into the impossible seen stirring each of our saphonophores diasporic at the same time seeing us in our lofty originary lead, roving where we are all the way to this thing dispersed. Round here we got our place in the sun saying even then what happens to our straining to feel. Leaning bent without leaning in to close our eyes and see wind in between the oppressed in times gone mythos spurious around sameness of exhaustion homeless agitation appears just wants to hallucinate eerie conjectures of decay detritus that we breathe from their dry pores and ashen finesse we hosts of their memories high water mineral echoes of grief can't help but fall in and out with the dark wash together Held up jettison away from self-snaring, couldn't get away whispering ultramarine. We speak in undulations, knowing full capture in escape. Used to meeting in each other's pockets when there's no more sacred in the small outside. No one else heard the system in the stoma. None listened in for love but for apotheosis, rewrote 
the blank indeterminate main. Fleet of foot through stone, your marsh meadow wood, unlike day star, ritual, ritual, still life, the fuck, the police. A black body is sacred everywhere, leaving no clues. Unlike day star, ritual, ritual, still life, the fuck, the police. Dead black body is sacred everywhere, leaving no clues. Raised, interlacing, a curious sleet in the iris under a deep rift. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, it's really lovely to be asked to read for this event, and I'm sorry I'm not able to be there in person. Uh, thank you to Sophia um, and to Ryan and to the others um, organizing this event uh, for having me and also um, looking forward to catching up with, on this event to, to see my fellow readers as well. I'm going to start off by um, reading a poem by uh, Lena Loy, partly because I think the theme is something to do with, I think, the body. Um, and Loy has always been a really important Kind of shaping force in my own work and it's always nice to start with somebody else's work um, other than your own. So I'm going to read from um, a series uh, called Italian Pictures which is early on in her career um, and uh, it's called Costa Magic. Her father indisposed to her marriage and a rabid man at that, my most sympathetic daughter Make yourself a conception, as large as this one, here but with yellow hair. From the house, issuing, Sunday dressed, combed precisely, splosh. Something pours viscous, malefic, unfamiliar, while listening up. I hear my husband mumbling, mumbling, mumbling at the window, malediction incantation under an hour her hand to her side pressing suffering being bewitched cesura fading daily daily feeble softer the doctor fithis the wise woman says to take her so we following her instruction i and the neighbor Take her. The glass rattling, the rain slipping, I and the neighbour and her aunt, bunched together, and Cesara droops across the cab. Fields and houses pass, like the pulling out of sweet meat ribbon from a rascal's mouth, till a wheel in a rut jerks back my girl on the padding and the hedges into the sky. Coming to the magic tree, Cesira becomes as a wild beast, a tree of age. If Cesira should not become as a wild beast, it is merely Thysis, be, this being the wise woman's instruction. Knowing she has to die, we drive home, to wait. She certainly does, in time. It is unnatural in a father bewitching a daughter whose hair down covers her thighs. Um, instead of reading from my second collection, Eidolon, um, which is about Helen of Troy. I'm actually going to go back and read from my first collection, which I very rarely read from. Um, and just sort of pick through and read a few things and then read some newer stuff. Invocation. To be of use, but nothing will decant. Perilous consonant, seized as jewel, betrothed as fire is to the ordinary, a spell, a note. Combatant of will and engraver of sighs, poultice to the hush, to the whispers of women in corded rooms, and to the glows beneath doorways. Purchaser of anointments, slatherer of knives and spoons, 
rind of merciless ends, and clothier of burrowed aliases, trenchant penurist, hoarder of silvered lakes. Post chaise, bending on the whim of royal deliverance, coin to whom there is no weight to match the fruit of emptied forest, animal to cistern, face to coda, god to neither me, to neither them, to she, to whom one is infinitely married and yet cannot be affixed. Enter. All that spills over from my able palm is you. Since this um, reading is um, sort of based in Nottingham, <clears throat> where I was born many years ago, um, I'm going to read a poem that uh, is about my mother's life. Uh, she grew up in Derby, um, and my father uh, came to marry her when he was in his 20s, and they lived in Nottingham. So this is a bit about her life, and um, my father is really very good at um, sort of telling the history of his life and also of our ancestors, and he's sort of the, I don't know, repository of knowledge and information when it comes to all things to do with family. But my mother is, um, I suppose, partly by virtue of being a woman, of course, in, in Punjabi culture, uh, less cognizant of these things, and... Um, I think even of her own life, not perhaps as much being the agent uh, of it and of her destiny. She keeps her silences. And so some of the silences are here. Um, and because when I was writing my PhD on Mina Loy, um, I spent a great deal of time in uh, her archive at Yale. And Loy herself wrote five, six different versions of her life story, all of them sort of in some way incomplete or um, pieced together and quite, in some cases quite fragmentary. Um, and I do a lot of archival work with modernist women writers and have done since. So I'm, I'm really interested in how archives present lives, um, sometimes much more faithfully than the kind of coherent biographies that we receive, either autobiographies written by people or, or in fact, those biographers who attempt to try to draw some sort of conclusion, um, because, of course, there is no conclusivity about any life. Archive for a Daughter. November 1972, Darby. A dance card embalmed in sweat. Her ruthless curve of palm, mowing the carpet into sheaves before a gas fire. Liquidescent virgin in a purple dress. Oil paint, shaded avocado, umbrella, sun wings. Box two, folder twenty, early married life. A single page. Recto, a fashionable center parting. Verso, consonants, midnight affair. Nuclear affair, bleach affair, watermark indecipherable. But here we are jumping ahead. The archivist notes that no exact birth date is known. An already western dressed six year old reads the headlines of English newspapers for party tricks. Her black eyes are blunt and unequivocal, like the prophecies of pharaohs. In a Punjabi village, she and her impeccable mother gemstoned, oracular, princess of Vernal Causeway. Box 1, Folder 2, Emigration. The BOAC stewardesses Max Factor crinkled baskets of sweets to soothe the girls' swinging, impatient feet. Aviation, a risky endeavor in 1963, levels a curse at her progeny. Aerophobia, her own daughter's Fear of the air between home and exile collapsing. Box 1, Folder 7, Education. Homeland's Grammar School for Girls. Miss Moore leans across an oak sea and parquets a line of future mothers. Her bovine sympathies neatly pressed, tentacled towards the only Indian in the class. 
the Georgian battle cross marking her forehead, kindly and thoughtfully segregates. The girl bounds wildly through the public library. Huxley, to her 11-year-old mind, suggests individuality, but the savage's feet recommend no one specific exit. Folders 8 through 17, unbound notebook, mostly unreadable. I thought I could become a doctor, and asking found I could not think to ask to become anything. The archivist notes that these pages are not continuous. Refer to Box 2, Folder 10, Correspondence, a photograph of a prospective husband, and several handwritten credentials. Box 3, Folder 1, Notes on Motherhood. Nursery, pram, groceries, pram. Doctor's visit, cucumbers in half lengths, over each shoulder some conspicuous intellect. Husband academic, wife typist. She door to doors Hoover's Avon thick rosaries of factory lace, while her children pop tic tacs for invented ailments in plastic houses. Nottingham hurls snowballs at her black turbaned gentleman. Soaked typescript. Fair copy of a life. When she asked her parents for a spare suitcase for an exodus, they replied, My child, nothing is ever spare. Box 4, Folder 1, Exile. 1985, Vancouver, ablaze with cherry blossoms from here to the kindergarten. We arrived with one steel pot, a bag of lentils, and an onion. Folder 2, 1987, North Hollywood. Submarine fences root Thanksgiving potatoes one apiece. My daughter reads Laura Ingalls Wilder to her menagerie of dolls. Raft sails calmly on. Folder 3, 1989, Oxnard. Gifted children are purse strings. We mind their collegiate years with interest. El Rio, wizens to a stockpile of citrus and rental agreements. Folder 4. 1995, Ventura. Bibled to real estate, gold blazers cinch round a wade of blonde, leathered adulterers. The neighbors tend their god plots of lawn and hedge. Box 5, Folder 1. Doctors Parmar. She saunas with the ladies of the Gold Coast, one Japanese ex-comfort woman, one savvy senora, gold-buckled and multi-franchised. Stanford, Northwestern, Harvard, London, Cambridge. And when my husband's sisters wept because I had no sons, I said I have two doctors, one of body, the other of mind, and sent my uterus via Federal Express to the village with my compliments. On the verso written in ink is a page from box one, folder eight, misplaced. I remember clearly when I knew that I would one day die. I was on the toilet and I was 11. The bathroom was white and oblivious. Loy returns to Paris. Le Bonheur, the bloodless mechanics of travel. Kicking at space is no arrival. You collect the child you left, now provincial and round, from planning menus and improving her script for four years in an Italian village. Julia's Negrita Joella, her, her curls browning illegitimately. The Rue Campagne Première, a grey hutched widow latch for a poire with fine bone structure. Refurbished vanities choir on workshop tables. Address book somersault, and a life is written from Z to pseudonym. Curving fingers smelt graphite into cracks. Fine noses of inherited genius, blackly spar, and bring turtles to your babies. Note their approving babble, for use in their trades. 
elbowed pages, snapped under books. Crooked deletions migrate in the direction of an echo. Festooned shadows bend over your youngest. Fa bene, dusting pillboxes, carrying colored glass from one childhood to the next. I'll just finish by reading some uh, newer work. That last poem, of course, was uh, also about uh, Mina Loy um, and about those extraordinary archival manuscripts, which are still unpublished. Um, but Loy does have a long autobiographical poem that one can find if one has the right edition um, from 1982. So I'm uh, going to read now from um, <clears throat> a poem that is based on the kind of the antiquary, I suppose, art historian, um, probably more more appropriately, um, um, uh, Winkelmann, Hannes Winkelmann, and uh, it's called An On Desire, uh, and this is sort of touches on his life and his his sort of story. But he was he was kind of the father of um, a sort of ideas of of beauty and nobility connected to a kind of classical structure, um, sculpture particularly, um, and so uh, he's a he was also a very very interesting. Um, person and ha met a very unfortunate fate. Um, so I will, uh, some of those things will be touched on in this poem. On Desire. What is the gift? To receive, she is touched, or the scuttle of her heart is mollified by its touch. Oh, to be touched by the gift, like being singled out and blessed by infirmity. The gift, simulacrum of love, and he who gives it does so, knowing that by giving it to me, nothing could really be gained. Black corollary of love, go trouble younger hearts. The man who wrote that phrase, the breadth of a single hair, noble simplicity and grandeur, also boasted, ich esse gut und ich scheiße gut. He could articulate it, and wanting it, had that gift of seeing that somewhere between these vivifications of consummate and evacuate is the completion of desire. Eugenics of art, Homer mentions no pitted face, no pox. Archangeli, who would disembowel the abbe, was not the tone-deaf Olympian Alcibiades fondling boys in the gymnasium, but a disfigured man of no account. Winkelmann wrote, much before his fated friendship, the archangel of Concha's face glows with indignation and revenge. Turning over rubble in the Villa Albani, Winkelmann observes the broad repose of time. Gleam of white light on a stone neck, on a pedestal of bone. Perhaps some conquest in a preternatural hour had carried off her head, or trampled her face to dust. Either way, he is sure that finding it is beyond his office. The absence makes her animal. He does not note this in his catalogue. What had Rodopi said all those hours to the ugliest of men? When she heard his fables, what love stiffened in the folds of garments that could hook itself to the promise of one wayward slipper? Chewing his, her thumbnail through his long-winded tail, she may have at last excoriated enough of your riddles. Here is the apple, and there is the tree appearing ordinary. Where is the tree? Despondent wife of Socrates, young and ancestrally equestrian, Santipa, meaning blonde horse, whom the old man would not woo. He, a cocotte in the world of men, a gadfly, she could only buck. True art in imitation or true propaganda, 
David's death of Socrates alarmed the Salon of 1787. The scroll at Plato's feet, death warrant or versifications of Aesop? Wise son of a midwife who in his final hours reared like the horse of Napoleon Bonaparte. Slave of Samos, gnarled hunchback, deformed fabulist, your animal phrase soils the footstools, footstools of Europe. There and also there, a fleet of eyes, each blackly identical, outminister the other. An unctuous industrialist pats his thorax. Dissolute, Parthenon, Parthenon, Parth Dissolute parthenogenist, man vis-a-vis -vis his instincts. We sniff our own blood. How you have multiplied in us, like an incandescence that holds itself up from the dark to colour a woman's cheeks. Slave girl, cinder girl, horse of a different colour. The wise busts of Herculaneum angle the torsos of headless girls. Withdrawing the candle from his window that opens onto the Porta Solaria, Winkelmann carries thoughts of his pupils' contours down tapestried corridors to bed following his moral windmill. Thanks very much for listening. Thank you again to Donica Kelly, James Goodwin and Sandy Palmer for those superb readings. Sadly, Donica, James and Sandeep are not here this evening to talk about and explore their readings with us. Instead, I will reflect on a few themes and in particular the socio-poetics which emerge for me from the readings we have heard. The chat is also open if anyone would like to drop in comments or reflections of their own and we could talk about those as well. Following on from James's intriguing workshop yesterday evening, the theme of socio-poetics emerges in all of tonight's readings, all in very different ways across the form of the poems and material influencing the poetics which we have been listening to. In his reading, James uses the line, writing is our passing through. And tonight's readings seem to offer alternative ways of thinking, feeling, reading, writing, and maybe even knowing a little more about our passing through or our curiosity about our passing through questioning what we're passing through, what we're making as we're passing through, and perhaps importantly, what we leave behind. James talks of trans transience and embodiment in his reading. He says, we don't know where we are, but we must be something other than who we are. And this who we are and what we might be weaves as an under and overcurrent through what we've been listening to this evening. Donica and Sandeep indicated some autobiographical elements within their work and presented poems which entered into a dialogue with forms of becoming which are identifiable as family structures. The poems we heard from Donica a rooted in myth, which provides a leaping off point for her poetic exploration of personal history and by extension, a form of making, unmaking and remaking of both personal and social histories. Poetry by the poet Rita Dove offers a perhaps touchstone and point of conversation for some of these poems, building part of Donica's socio-poetics. In contrast, James develops a socio-poetics in dialogue with and constructed through language drawn from many philosophical texts, experimentality as a process and processes and a distinct black socio-poetics, which he addresses as corporal reality and embodiment. The visual component of James's reading brings into this poetics an ocular as well as oral dimension, inviting questions about what we think we are perceiving in this poetry and this poetics. 
raising the question of what is this embodiment James's poetry is inviting us to consider and bringing us as listeners closer into. Although different socio-poetics, and also I would argue a social, sociable poetics, is offered in Sandeep's poetry, which seems to both seek and find a socio-poetics through her literary predecessors, which is here located in the tradition of the avant-garde, and in particular, women avant-garde poets. The modernist poet Mina Loy provided a touchstone for the poems we've listened to this evening. The poetics and poems we've listened to all register the violence of social injustices at the level of what language does and can do. Donica, James and Sandeep collectively have opened a space where we can consider ourselves, our world and worlds and how we continually make and remake ourselves, our histories and perhaps also our futures through language. Poetry here is a sociable, social practice and perhaps, particularly now, more pressingly, the social is a sociable, poetic practice. I'd like to thank again Donica Kelly, James Goodwin and Sandy Palmer for their readings this evening. Thank you so much. Thank you all so much, Danika James and Zandeep for the beautiful and thought provoking words and Linda for your insightful reflections as well. Before we end, um, I would just like to invite you all to our next Five Bodies session, which will take place on Thursday, the 11th of February next year. We'll be welcoming three wonderful artists and writers. We have Jesse Darling, Joanna Hedver and Camila Janan Rashid all joining us. So I do hope you'll join us in the new year. And for now, enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you, everyone.